pretty repetitive, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, but um, I, it was so great to read this book. Um, it was great to read it on its own terms. I have a particular interest in it because it resonates a great deal with um, the things that I am, sorry, um, the things that I'm working on and writing about um, in my book. Um, but I would also, I, I wanted to start with a similar comment to what Susan made, which is that the this book really um, unsettles um, the, the picture that many people have of camps, what they are, what they're like. Um, and this need to unsettle that is, I mean, it's definitely something that I have confronted in my work, and partly that people expect, in the case of Palestinian camps, which we'll get to, people think, look at them and say, that doesn't look like what I think a camp should look like, so why are you talking about it as an instance of this phenomenon? Um, so the more that we can do to sort of trouble um, the widespread expectations that camps are only tents, that they are only places for bare life, and also only part of distant geographies, where, where, whatever that geography is. Um, these are very widespread um, assumptions feel, um, about camps and are wrong. Right? Um, and the work, this work on the history and multiplicity of camps in Britain makes this abundantly clear from every, at every level. Like the, there's a map at the beginning of the book which just shows the incredible range of places where there were camps. Um, so all over this geography, right? So not only are they in Britain, but they're all over. Right? And um, I wanted to read just one sentence or two from, from the introduction to your book, because I think it really sort of set, like, says what it is. The aim of this book is not to redeem camps, nor indeed to condemn them. It is to refuse to ignore them. Now more than ever, these spaces must not be isolated from history, nor from civic life. They are crucial sites of encounters and entanglements that have had profoundly transformative effects, without which certain inequalities <coughs> will remain opaque. So the demand in this book is not, I mean, it provides for us a counter history to the, what we expect of camps. And then it demands that we then think differently about, mm -hmm. about every space that we occupy, because we can understand in this instance, but I, the lessons are much broader than than for for Britain. Um, and um, well, another thing that I was really struck by in reading this was the incredible, as, as both of you have already indicated, the incredible diversity of populations and experiences. And again, the ways in which the the British authorities who are and volunteers who are working in this in these camps are trying to attend to this diversity. So this is again something that we tend not to think about about the, the camp experience and the refugee experience, that people's specificity, their cultural specificity, their palates, um, was part of how um, the, the camps were organized. So you know, their descriptions of, you know, of you know, meals that are designed to respond to what people thought are the appropriate um, kind of cultural terrain lessons in like Polish history. And there's a a description of an of an Austrian Jewish woman, girl woman who had you know, not grown up with Jewish traditions, being taught the horror in the camp. So there's you know, there's this very you know kind of strange um, both every it's a it's an it's an effort to be responsive to what what people's backgrounds are, but also a presumption of what people are bringing with them. And I'm aware that we have limited time, but I wanted to just maybe say one other thing about a, a, another aspect of the argument that I found very interesting. Because um, there's an incredible, I mean, really, there's just rich detail throughout the book, so you have to read it to, to get it, and you should. Um, but I was really interested in the discussion about class in the camps. Um, and so there's several aspects to this kind of consideration of camps, both the question of what class authorities imagined and expected the refugees to come from, um, and also what class they imagined and expected them that they would settle into. So there's, there's both this sort of effort to typologize that certain ethnicities or nationalities are likely to be of a certain class, but also then to try to distinguish among them. There's a description of um, Belgians arriving at ports of, of entry and being given pink cards or blue cards, depending on how they were apprehended, you know, with whether they were poor or wealthy, and then sent in different places um, because of that. Um, but then also the possibility that camps might be restorative of their, of their prior lives 
and then along with that, a worry that the that time in the camps might disrupt that capacity for restoration. Because one anxiety and you know, anxiety about camps here and, and more broadly is that what is that the idleness of camp life can be corrosive um, to people. So there's this whole question about you know sort of what what comes in class wise and what can go out then for people's life trajectories and, and class possibilities. And this is that's just sort of one slice of the kinds of things that you see about how people were, were, were engaged and how they um, themselves engaged with the environments that they um, found themselves. And I think I'm about out of time, but I was, I was very struck also by the sort of trajectory of um, how it is that people thought about not just the different groups of refugees, but what a, what a refugee might be, right? A refugee as, as somebody who can be thought of in terms of welfare to somebody who should be apprehended through a more punitive regime of immigration. Um, and again, these are lessons that are not only historical, but for us to grapple with now. So thank you. Um, you. Yeah. <laughs> it's your turn. Sounds good. We uh, change books. What's that? We change books. Oh, we, we did. did. All right. I'll so, be closing the books. Yeah. All right. So now we're turning to uh, the next book. Uh, uh, so thanks uh, also to uh, Eileen uh, for uh, making this uh, possible. I was here in two. Oh, I was here in uh, 2014, 2015, uh, and it was uh, during that uh, period that uh, I. Uh, basically rewrote the uh, entire book, so it's uh, nice to kind of bring it home in a way. Uh, it's also uh, really wonderful to be in the company of these uh, two other books, uh, so I kind of look at my book and I say, lucky you. <laughs> uh, the uh, cover uh, of the book is uh, by an artist named uh, Dea al uh, and uh, uh, even though the book is uh, not about uh, camps, and even though it's not about uh, Palestine, uh, the uh, title of the piece is uh, 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 the Massacre of Sabra and Shatila, uh, one of eight, we are seen but not heard only as corpses. Something like that. Uh, War for Peace, and because we have uh, very limited time, I am going to read. Uh, War for Peace is about peace as a political concept and as a moralized ideal. It focuses on peace in the writings of ten canonical thinkers in political theory, Plato, Il Farabi, Linus, Erasmus, Gentili, Grotius, Ibn Khaldun, Hobbes, Kant, and Sayyid Qutb. The book questions peace, or how the compulsive desire for peace defines what it means to be human or civilized or good, and the moralities that this then puts into play and the politics that it enables. It's framed around the repeated idea that war is for the sake of peace, or the paradoxical position of peace both opposing war and authorizing war. So I'm going to read bits and pieces from the introduction to give you a few provocations also from the chapters as a whole. Uh, peace is a troubling ideal. That's how I open the book. We often hear its name spoken as a permanently desirable and universal moral ideal. It is today a pervasive belief that to be human, civilized, and good is to value peace, to desire peace. Only the most inhuman monsters do not love it. The belief in peace as a basic human desire and universal aspiration occludes just how readily its invocations dehumanize enemies, sanitize violence, and silence dissent. This is not to disregard that sometimes appeals to peace can offer an effective platform for change, resistance, or critique, but it is to question the work that a general belief in peace or a desire for peace performs. The conceptual grammar of peace orders the world by calling for peace and security, peace and unity, order, law, friendship, or development. It describes peace and violence in terms of symmetry and equivalence between given entities, and it treats peace as the one thing that all people must wish for and desire. And within this grammar, the paradoxical idea that war is for the sake of peace continues to circulate in contemporary public discourses around the globe as well as in major works of historical and contemporary political theory. This is an arsenal that has proven useful to the perpetuation of inequality and violence. The grammar of peace has tended to deflect attention from structures of power. 
I see the book as an attempt at unmaking peace or bringing into view instead of covering up exactly what it is that makes peace troubling. At its barest, it's an invitation to look more critically, more skeptically at those who claim to speak in the name of peace, at the ostensibly universal desire for peace, and at the dominant grammar of peace. So to see peace fundamentally as a problem. At its most ambitious, it is a genealogy of the moralities of peace. I offer three overarching arguments, basically that peace is parasitical because we always talk about peace and something else, peace and security, peace and law, not peace on its own. Second, it's provincial, its universalization reflects uh, different anthropological hierarchies, desires, fears, anxieties, and partial constructions of the globe. And finally, I say it is polemical, that's the last of my P's, uh, in saying that its idealization is the product of specific antagonisms whose moralities are often forgotten, even as peace then continues to enable hostility. The book traces a logic of peace that necessitates war and then sanctions hierarchies within humanity. I'm going to give you some flavor of the kinds of moves that I make in the book just in three provocations. With Al-Farabi and Aquinas, the idea of the peace lover who wages just war against a warlike enemy actually results in a deep irony. The peace lover and his enemy resemble each other. The difference is one of them talks about peace. The moral economy of peace is embedded in a political economy of war. In chapter 5, instead of reading Hobbes as the theorist of state sovereignty or the English Civil War, I suggest that Hobbes theorizes settler colonialism. The desires and the life that he associates with peace actually end up spreading war, death, and the uneven valuation of lives across the globe. Kant's hospitality grows out of his racialized construction of the Arab, and his globe is formed by Orientalism and its discourses about camels. <laughs> Qutb, the Islamist, is a theorist of the racialization of Muslims and the colonial production of global peace. These chapters were all critical of idealizing peace, so instead of asking how we might attain world peace for all, the question here is why we insist on the name peace, how that name itself orders our understandings of political solutions, who gets to ponder these solutions and invoke peace in the process. Peace is not the solution, it is a problem. This book is a genealogy of peace in order to move beyond peace. I think it's Elena first. Ah, okay. you, you, you go first, yes. Okay. <laughs> According to the plan. I have a blueprint. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. Actually, um, the, um, you, Murad, you, you prefaced your, your comments by saying that yours was not a book about Palestine, but I thought it was a book about Palestine. <laughs> that's how I'm going to respond to it. <laughs> Um, I mean, I know, okay, but that's not, I mean, yes. actually, Palestine is in here and runs throughout, but I, but I really, uh, I read it through my own interest in it. Um, and I was this is really a vitally necessary book. Um, and in order to, so why do I see it as a, as a book about Palestine? And Palestine is just one instance, a very important instance, but it's one instance where the, the problems that you identify and the dynamics that, that are described in the book um, Play out. Because, of course, in Palestine, the language, protocols, and procedures of peace and peace building has been deployed as a weapon against Palestinians and their political aspirations for decades. Um, and, you know, a lot of the way that that is talked about is either the question of the failures of the, of the peace process or a kind of cynicism that what's at stake is not peace and that it's, you know, that's just a smokescreen. But this book gives us really crucial analytic to understand the way it is and the fact that it's not that it's not peace and that's the problem. It's sometimes that is the problem, but that it, it is through peace that some, that some of these things happen um, and it, that peace works to shift the political debate in ways that are detrimental, um, um, in this case, to Palestinians. And so it, we need to understand how peace, uh, not just how peace has been used, but what it is Right, what it has been, what it can be. Um, and um, so in relation to, I want to stick, I will, I will eventually, I promise, sort of move away from, from Palestine, but, but the, 
the three P's that, that you provide to, to help us make sense generally of how, or, you know, it's not, there's nothing general about this, but more broadly about how, how peace has, has been articulated, um, I found very helpful to, to see how, it's, how it has been um, used in this context. Certainly, um, the polemical aspect of peace, um, that it is, you know, uh, as you say, sort of elaborated with specific enemies in view, that the central character for peace is the enemy. Um, and, and if there's anything permanent, really, it's that what is permanent is the enemy. And that, um, that certainly has, has um, been the case here, where sort of peace is, is defined as a quality attached to one party, in this case Israel, and foreign to Palestinians who, are, who must um, occupy the enemy. Uh, the role of the enemy. Also, the, the ways that peace is parasitical, right? It is, you know, that, it, that in order to be deemed to be in the realm of talk of being peaceful, being a peacemaker, talking about peace, you need to accede to and ex accept a whole set of other concepts which might be quite antithetical to pursuits of justice, pursuits of restitution. <clears throat> All of those things have no place if they can't, if they've already been deemed against the attributes or the correlates that go along with peace. Um, and then the, the, certainly the, the notion that this is a, peace is a, is a term that des describes itself as universal but is always provincial, right? And provincial partly because it is the, it is the domain of only some. Um, and so just to say, you know, so I, I in my own, you know, very, my own particular interest, I got so much out of reading through this really um, wide-ranging um, you know, text that covers an enormous amount of intellectual ground, which you hinted at, but you can't pot It's another one. You have to read it <laughs> to, um, to understand just how um, incisive all the arguments are. But I wanted to very briefly um, talk about a couple of the, the concepts. And, and again, sort of reflecting my own interest, I, this, these are from the chapter on um, Kant and Kutub. Um, and you know, through the reading of, of um, Kant and Kutub, and the, the pairings in all of these chapters are, are really illuminating. Um, so peace that you show is not just a historical concept, though it is that, but very much a concept that entails a theory of history, right? that it is a theory of history. Um, and really, it's a theory at the end of history. And, um, you know, particularly you know, the idea of perpetual peace um, is of, um, of history at its end. And that what you were, the, the teleology is a teleology of end times, really. Um, and so one of the, you know, in addition to laying out the three P's that, that, pe that peace entails, uh, Murad identifies, in some sense, three alternative uh, possibilities. Um, Truce and um, per particular peace, right? So peace between that declares itself its particularities and the ethics of separation. Um, and I, I mean, they were all very interesting. Um, the I maybe I'll say a little bit about the idea of a truce because, of course, you know, he, in reading Kant, specifically describes truce as an, from Kant's perspective inadequate. It doesn't have the correlates. It doesn't have the the, the permanence and the perpetual nature. And Murad suggests that maybe it is precisely in those limits that something like truce may be the place where we would want to um, hang our hat, direct our attention, right? If, if the question is um, a pursuit of justice, a resolution of conflict, that the idea of a thing for now, it faced with the problems that you have, with the particular people that you have, that isn't the end of history. Right? We are in, you know, yeah, we're, we're, we never have the end of history, but the truce can be um, potentially a way forward. And I think, given time, I will stop there, but read the book. <laughs> <laughs> read the book. Read the book is, uh, I think, the three most important words. I uh, uh, read the book. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, past tense. But it will be future tense as well. Um, I also uh, was a little bit embarrassed because I couldn't write anything. 
So I went through your waste bin and, and, and found a, and an opened letter addressed to you in Arabic. So I did not even have to open it because with digital humanities these days you can do all kind of post-human things. So a machine read it for me. And uh, I found it quite interesting, so I'm just going to read it to you. It's, it's, uh, it's dated in, in New York City in the 19th decade, quarter D of Germany, out of 227, which happens to be today. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, I know, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's astonishing. I hope this letter finds you and dear Murat, sorry. I hope this letter finds you and your family very well. Uh, if there are problems in, with English, it's because of the translation. I remember it's uh, you know it's dressed in Arabic. I would like to tell you what I think about. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I have just read your book War for Peace. Thanks for saving a copy for me. I would like to tell you what I think about it, given that you did not ask for my opinion. But you know the saying about everybody having an opinion that Clint Eastwood made sadly famous a lifetime ago. To give you my opinion, I need to be frank, even blunt. So forgive me if I begin with a criticism. Uh, but I feel it is my duty to do it, and like Frederick the Parrot apprentice in the Pirates of Penzance, I am the slave of duty. That doesn't begin well. What I cannot understand for the life of me is why on earth you did not write and publish this book in 2008. You will say, but I was 24. I know, but this is such a lame excuse. A good friend would have overcome this minor obstacle to save me a couple of years of embarrassment in a couple of seminars and a few presentations on peace and peacemaking. Had I had this book at that time, my ideas would have been clearer, more brilliant, and indeed I would have probably started to actually think about peace, instead of just trying to come up with some fragmentary unfinished thoughts. You should have, and you did not. <laughs> But at least now you redeem yourself and finally give the book to the printing press. I can only imagine your struggle, your effort, and those good translations. Are those good translations of the literal root JHD? In your conversation with the copy editor from Oxford University Press, she or he wanted you to get rid of all those, all those diacritics when she or he said those words have already been incorporated in the English language. But the English language only incorporates those words, those concepts by eliminate, eliminating the critique through, the diacriticism that come with them. English language only incorporates those, those words by taming them, by deactivating them, by putting them in a place where they can be observed, redefined, submitted to a very basic colonial form of criticism, put on the spotlight of their otherness. So I was moved when I read note 22 of your introduction, page 13, where you wrote for this, 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 this <laughs> where you wrote the following winged words, he's read, or uh, Homer. Although the word jihad is now an English word, the Roman type fails to signify that it is domesticated precisely as something foreign and that its status is a source of political controversy. In this census, there are important distinctions between jihad and jihad, and the stakes of writing one or the other are different from other borrowings, such as algebra instead of algebra, or coffee instead of halab. The italics and diacritics make the difference. That was smart, how you cunningly explained how the Roman type was unable to keep up with the challenge of the Arabic word. The Roman type. Ah, I mean, you, I, I know you mean typography, but the other Roman type, the Western type, is also lurking behind, you, behind your words. I know that you read uh, that to read you, I need to read between your lines and not just on top of them. Otherwise, if I read only what you have written, I would have failed to see what are the stakes of your study. How this war for peace trope in its multiple iterations across a masculine history of ten thinkers is indeed a contemporary call for thought and action, and not just genealogies, as you claim in your subtitle. But we know that when we talk about genealogies, we are not talking about the painstaking exploration Foucault talked about when he said that la genealogie est grise. Elle est méticuleuse et patiemment documentaire. Elle travaille sur des parchemins embrouillés, ratés, plusieurs fois réécrits. Genealogies are the institutional paths that lead to the formation of those institutions and at the same time make us think that they are not institutions but natural, spontaneous occurrences. And what you demonstrate is that there is nothing natural or spontaneous about peace, but rather that this is an institution 
that becoming parasitic of multiple other institutions ends up being a problem and not a solution, ends up being an institution that is servant of war. And sure, you work on all that, and you insist in retranslating Greek and Latin and Arabic texts that are muddled and have been scratched and have been rewritten 1,000 times. But your gene genealogy is not great. Uh, it is not great by any means. Instead, it is luminous, in the most exact concept of luminosity. It sheds light into the descriptive world of semantics, of the semantics of peace. Or as you frequently put in your book, uh, using one of your favorite words, into the grammar that constitutes the R, the technique whereby peace can be put in language and expand itself and its parasitic character through language and through actions. When I mean that you shed light into this grammar or this semantic of peace, I mean it. You come up with a new concept that allows us to understand how semantic fields are formed. It is not sufficient for you to define a semantic field, to describe it, to say, here it is, there you are, the semantic field of peace throughout history in five or six languages. On the contrary, you delve into the many different protean ways in which a given discourse of peace, which cannot be confused with other discourses on peace, even if they claim to be commenting similar sources, insinuates other concepts that are perhaps more palatable than peace because unlike the idea of peace they point to specific emotions specific actions specific objects of desire friendship is one of them but then friendship is not the same in all of your in all your authors and it is at its turn a protean insinuate of peace al farabis insinuates are def definitely not the same Aquinas, the returned Dominican, said as, pri as his primal ones as the necessary addition to concord, namely goodness, unity, and friendship. And in that sense, this is also a book on friendship. And I was astonished, astonished to read that book, on friend, uh, uh, that book on friendship getting its way through a book that did not claim to be dealing with friendship. How friendship is itself a concept that struggles to become a political and legal institution that intends in vain to get rid of its theological load, just like peace cannot, fully, uh, cannot be fully extracted from theologies. If anything, I don't want to know more about this, but Murad, I know to know about when I, I want to know about when you are going to write a book of friendship so that I can blame you for not having published it before I submitted my last book for publication and saving me a lot of embarrassment as well. There are so many books nested in this book. And also it must be because this is a book about nesting, about how peace is nested in peace, and how the effusion of insinuates are cross-nested and internested, and well, May they nest in peace. <laughs> on the one of the insinuates of peace that does, does not uh, seem to appear often in your book is that of amnesia, or the voluntary forgetfulness that comes from amnesty as one of the insinuates of peacemaking, forgetting the past, the foreign country where they, who are they, we don't know, do things differently there, as Harley wrote. Now, amnesty and memory, and juridical memory altogether, seems to me to be a crucial insinuate. This is not a critique, it is a way to think with you. Amnesty is a pact, and as Saint Isidore said, pactus comes from pakis, from making peace, which is one of the forms in which peace, in which peace is institutionalized. You have to make it. There is a moment with Grotius and with Hobbes and with everybody writing after what some contemporaries call the invention of America, using the, using the rhetorical word inventio to find out, to discuss this legal political character of peace. Peace is a political issue because it is a legal issue. Because in international law there are no longer war operations, there are all peace operations. Mm -hmm. That is, the struggle to find out how to build a pact. You help me thinking with you. You give me the theoretical and semantic strength to look for other insidious insinuates that pervade this constellational tradition in Arabic, Greek, Latin, and other languages in which the discourse of war for peace has become one of the centers of attention. Before I said, and I was kind of as smart as saying it, <laughs> please forgive me for that, he says, that your ten thinkers are all men, and that they are. Yeah, but I thank you for helping me think through some other thinkers that did not make it into your book, including Christine de Pizan and her a book on peace, uh, written in the midst of civil wars, and how she analyzes the, way of the ways of peace 
that, are, that is, how she develops the parasitic character of peace and what are her insinuates. I want to thank you for this. And this is my farewell for today. I would have liked to talk about how you wrote your book, how about your own style. I would have liked to talk about how you redefine aesthetics. I would have liked to talk about the central importance of the minor key interludes, which in fact are pieces of intense lyricism, that is, theoretical importance, actual seminars for new concepts. I would have liked to talk about all ten authors and about ourselves, but most of all, I wanted to celebrate this book for you. Abrazos, J. P.S. You didn't see my copy of the book. Thank you. Now we learn. <laughs> Um, thank you. So, I, uh, in the tradition of my other authors, I'll say I was here at the Society Fellows from 2002 to 2004, um, and I, I wouldn't say I, I prepared to write my first book here. I, I don't know. Um, and um, the also, I guess, to comment on the cover, since you guys commented on, on air covers, one of the I'm very pleased with the cover of, of the book. Um, and everybody knows, like, one of the challenges is that you write the book and then the, the publisher doesn't promise you to, to give you a cover that you're satisfied with. And when you're working on something about refugees, I would, you know, there's so many terrible things that could happen, um, and, and none of them did. Um, so, um, so to say very briefly um, what I'm going to do in this book, it's a, it's a book about the Palestinian refugee experience, living with against, in relation to humanitarian assistance uh, for seven decades. So from 1948, um, when I started the project, I would say from 1948 to the present, but there, I mean, there, there, there came to be a conclusion, not only because the book had to be written, but the events in Syria were, came, sort of marked a, an ending point for me, because they, in certain places they really, of course, transformed things, and that is not as is often the case, I gesture to it in the conclusion, but that's not um, the subject of this book. But I'm looking across um, the, the, basically the five primary fields where, the, where UNRWA, which is the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees, works, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, the West Bank, and Gaza. And doing um, archival research and ethnographic work. Um, I was trained as a historian and, and anthropologist and try to live in between somehow. Um, so, I'm exploring throughout here two sets of questions. One about humanitarianism, and um, particularly about what happens to humanitarianism as it becomes long term. Um, you know, this is a form of intervention that is sort of self conceived, that is apprehended, and self defined as a crisis intervention. You know, get in, get out. Um, but in Frequently and increasingly, this is not the case in, in you know across the globe. So the Palestinians, which are all, the case is often identified as exceptional, but it's just on one end of a spectrum of what is an extremely common phenomenon of protracted displacement and therefore the need for long-term humanitarian assistance. But that that long those long-term conditions do pose challenges for humanitarian actors and for the humanitarian apparatus. So what? How does humanitarianism respond? when it has to deal with crisis, uh, with chronic conditions as much as crisis situations. How is its purpose challenged and redefined, and how are humanitarian mandates and constituencies stretched, reconfigured, and limited by that process? And then I have a set of questions about uh, how Palestinians, who have lived with humanitarian assistance over multiple generations, multiple decades, how they pursue their lives and politics in this context. And particularly, I'm interested in the ways in which humanitarian procedures, discourses, and materials can provide tools for, as much as impediments to, their efforts to make claims and live their lives. So I'm looking both at what would be sort of the more familiar humanitarian politics of life, right, sort of the governance of populations through humanitarianism, and also the politics of living in humanitarian spaces, how people survive and strive, and again, not just despite, though sometimes despite, but through the humanitarian apparatus. Um, and so in looking at this sort of extended time frame, I'm 
use the term punctuated humanitarianism to try to describe the move between the chronic and the crisis from the humanitarian situation, which is that crisis moment that generates a response, to the humanitarian condition, sort of the long-term process of living with chronic need, which is no less connected to the, the causes of, humanitar of a humanitarian situation, but it's sort of ebbed into a different rhythm, different flow. And the, I, I, what I'm trying to capture with the, the idea of punctuated humanitarianism is both this sort of oscillating experience between crisis and chronic, the shifting rhythms of change where things, you know, there is this ebbing and then a, you know, a um, sort of sudden and dramatic rupture into crisis, um, or, you know, um, and then the varieties of efforts to respond to those things. And I'm looking at the effects of these dynamics on both providers and recipients. So for providers, you have um, a phenomenon where, in fact, humanit humanitarian providers are by and large energized and given purpose by emergency. You know, they, you know, so they're, which is not to say that they are happy when there is an emergency, but they are clear when there, there is an emergency, and, it, and very uncertain about how to respond to chronic conditions. And then even more so, and this is what you often see in the case of Palestinians in, in camps, is that their conditions are not just chronic, but seemingly unchangeable. So not only can you not save a life, because life is not at risk, it's not very clear that you can change a life, and, but yet you have an imperative to act. And so this is one of the, this is one of the challenges that providers grapple with over this. And then for recipients, um, these changing rhythms mean that people move in and out of very different relationships to a humanitarian apparatus, which of course is itself changing over time. And in the midst of violence, which is the time when need feels more, most acute, that is often a time when humanitarians cannot actually reach people. Um, and then in, again, in chronic conditions, as I said, they often can't do much for them. And then on the, the question of how people, the sort of politics of living and sort of po Palestinian politics in, the, in these contexts, in this kind of long-term humanitarian condition, I'm interested in what I describe as a discordant politics. Um, and by that I mean that people are engaged with multiple temporalities, multiple geographies, multiple goals all at once, right? The, the, the near of Lebanon and the far of Palestine. The better life tomorrow and a restored life in, the, in some distant future. And liberation versus improvement, right? And all of these aims are part of the palette of Palestinian political claims. But the fact that they're all part of this palette doesn't mean that they fit smoothly together, right? They, they're, they are sometimes and often um, in contradiction or are felt to be in contradiction. People worry that, the, that one sort of goal may get in the way of the other. And yet there, there is a necessity to pursue a politics of, uh, across all of these lines. Um, and in so doing, people make of the refugee category and the refugee status a category which is not meant to provide, to offer a political status. They make it a political, a, they make, claim it and make it a, a place of political subjectivity, and from which people make, to take a variety of actions and make a variety of claims, both claiming a right to humanitarianism, but also claiming humanitarian rights, and claiming that humanitarian rights are themselves political rights. Um, um, well, thank you. Um, I'm a longtime reader and a big fan of Alana's work, so it was really a great pleasure to have a chance to respond to this wonderful new book. Um, and as someone who's worked on refugee camps in another context, there was so much that resonated for me here, um, but there's also so much that's unfamiliar and surprising. And I think that's because what, um, part of what the book does so deftly is it highlights both what is distinctive about the Palestinian refugee experience and also what's emblematic about it. And I think it holds that tension between um, the distinctive and the emblematic um, in really nuanced ways throughout the story. And I think that's so important because for scholars of refugees, 
Palestinians are often taken as the archetypal refugees, right? They are the Ur refugees, uh, the world's best known refugees, and yet there are also no other refugees like them in that kind of um, familiar narrative. Um, and so I think it's very important that uh, Alana reminds us of these kind of unexpected ways that Palestinians have lived both in and against humanitarianism for 70 years, um, perhaps the longest emergency. And I was very interested to read um, how some people feel closer to the camp um, at the stage that Alana was doing her research than they do to this long lost Palestine. Um, and I was really struck by a comment from one refugee um, who was interviewed, uh, Aliyah, I think her name, um, who has a, this very deep attachment to her camp in East Amman. Um, I just wanted to read a quote from her uh, that's in the book. She says, I love the camp, to be honest. I have the ability to leave it, but the nature of the camp, my connection to my cause, my connection with the national suffering are what is connecting me to the camp. So there's this very profound tie um, that this woman has to the camp that is, I think, really unexpected. Um, so there's an important move away here from more familiar uh, narratives by Hannah Arendt onwards um, that really see refugee life only in terms of objection and despair. And I think Alana really shifts that, um, that discourse to be much more diverse and um, much, much wider. Uh, one of the major contributions of the book is that it's not content with the humanitarian perspective, uh, but it really does so much to highlight the voices and perspectives of the Palestinians themselves. Um, and one of the elements that's really brought out by Alana's uh, really stunning ethnographic research is how refugees actually understand the categories that they inhabit and the experiences that they've had. So she really gets us into um, how they think of and how they judge each other. Um, and I was, I was very intrigued to see that some of the starkest divisions in this book are not between humanitarians and refugees, which we might come into the book trying to expect. Um, but what she reveals is that you know, the vast majority of humanitarians or aid workers in this context are themselves refugees. So it's, there's not populations that we can separate out. There's not a sharp distinction between people who give aid and people who receive it. Um, so Susan made this very welcome point about the fungibility of categories in my book. And I think that um, really resonates in Alana's work too, that um, you, can't, you can't necessarily tell by looking you know, who is a refugee, who is a humanitarian. And these are people who are very deeply interconnected with one another. So instead, the biggest divide is really between refugees of different generations, um, those who remember Palestine and those who remember only the camp that kind of form their political subjectivities and stances around that experience. Um, so I was interested to see that even the term refugee is generationally defined. Um, so for older people, if Alana asked them you know, what being a refugee meant to them, how did they understand that term? they really focus on the experience of having left their villages. So, you know, why are you a refugee? Well, because we left. We left where we were from. Um, and that's really this kind of defining, um, that's what makes you a refugee, is that you've left where you were from. But for the younger generation, that leaving is really a betrayal and a mistake um, of the Palestinian um, identity. So they say things like, you know, it was their fault. They shouldn't have run away. Um, so there's this very interesting generational split, um, even in just understanding what it means to be a refugee. Humanitarianism has a very troubled relationship to generation in this book, um, because it has a troubled relationship to time. Um, it's intended, of course, always to be temporary. And I think what Alana brings out is just how uh, durable and endless the temporary can be in a refugee context. Um, so I just wanted to pull out two moments in the book related to the time scale in which refugees live. Um, and I want to mention she has this really vivid idea of punctuated time or oscillating time um, in which refugees live. So one seems to be um, a kind of optimistic moment in the book, which is a sign from a disability rehabilitation center um, that says, it is my right to have a bright future. And I thought that was really interesting to think about one's relationship to time and one's relationship to the future specifically as a right, to declare that as a, a right that people can claim. Um, and it evokes one of the contradictions that refugees have to live with, I think not just in, uh, not just Palestinian refugees, um, but elsewhere as well, 
you know, as Alana puts it, how do you make demands for a better life now, even as you're insisting on the right to anticipate a fundamentally different future, right? How do you hold that, that contradiction? So there's that it's kind of um, possibly optimistic moment where we see someone um, making a claim for their right to imagine a future in which they are not refugees, they are not in the camp, but they are also enmeshed in the camp at the moment they make that claim. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we have what to me was the most shocking moment in the book, where the claims of the future are kind of shut down. And that is when a number of refugees told Alana um, that refugees don't have the right to live past the age of 60, um, which initially sounded hyperbolic and, and kind of you know hard to understand. But then she found, in fact, this was Amna's um, position um, that everything except primary medical care would be withdrawn for refugees after they turned 60. Um, so that, that moment of those disjunctures are really striking to me, especially as a historian who, um, whose experiences with oral histories and interviews have often been sources of great frustration. So I was really interested to see um, the relationship in this book between documents and interviews. Um, and I, I hope Alana might tell us a little bit more about that, that relationship between archives and field work, um, or archives and, and ethnographic research, and what could be learned or overlooked by each mode of research you were in. You know, when you're being an anthropologist or being a historian, I realize that's kind of a, a, also a false divide. Um, but I wondered if different modes of research generated different arguments for you, um, and maybe even drove that bipartite structure of the book, of the humanitarian situation and the humanitarian condition. It struck me that humanitarians have changed less than refugees over time, um, that the way that they debate whether camps will make refugees idle, um, will it sap their initiative, that could be like the 30s, the 50s, the 70s, or today that humanitarians are saying those things. Um, so I wondered whether humanitarians were the static ones while refugees are more dynamic. Um, and then I also wanted to pose a question about the political futures that the book points towards. Um, because Alana makes this very compelling point that the lessons of the Palestinian experience are not just for other refugee groups, but they're really for all of us who live in this world. Um, because they demonstrate what forms of politics are possible even in conditions of enormous precarity. Um, so they make us ask what can change when there's so much that can't change, um, which I think is a very instructive lesson in our contemporary world. Um, so I took the final chapters of the book to suggest that the most promising programs from Alana's point of view um, are those that are aimed not at material improvement, but a kind of reorientation of perspective for refugees. Um, and since that's where the book ends, I, I would love to hear more about what kind of politics you imagine could result or emerge from that reorientation um, and what you see as the range of possibilities. So starting point for more conversation. Thank you. Uh, so I first encountered uh, uh, Alana's work uh, uh, in 2009, I think. Uh, we were at someone's house, and uh, the person introduced uh, Alana, and I said, ah, governing Gaza. Uh, so uh, it's nice to be uh, commenting on uh, life uh, lived in relief. Uh, it is uh, incredible, and it's also uh, uh, devastating. It's beautifully written, it is crisp, it is clear, it is theoretically incisive. Uh, and I burned right through it, but it was also, uh, it's a very heavy book, uh, and you must read it. Uh, it binds its theoretical interventions, its dissection of humanitarian organizations, their negotiations with governments, the records and transformations of refugee everyday life, and how refugees themselves understand or theorize the category refugee. So Ilana rethinks the category refugee as it's applied, lived, inhabited, refused, resisted, and reworked. She compellingly shows us that refugees are, as she puts it, world-forming. So in her recovery of the sites of politics and their conditions of possibility, I actually read this book uh, as speaking broadly to anthropology and to history and to Middle East studies, uh, and also to the humanities and political theory especially, and not just for the very important corrective of Arendt and Agamben and others who've uh, uh, attempted to theorize the question of uh, refugees in ways that the book, I think, compellingly shows have been far too uh, limited and limiting. Uh, the book beautifully maps out the questions that confront Palestinian refugees and humanitarian organizations, as well as their disjunctures, both between one another and also within them, as we just heard. 
In the humanitarian frame, ideas of survival, saving, and helping reign supreme, questions about who counts as a refugee, provisions, generational change, health care, or as Ilana puts it, under care, these become technical questions within the mandate of saving. But crucially, and this point came out earlier, I really want to highlight it, the question of refugees has always been a political one. It's about dispossession, settler colonialism, the right of return, the obligations of the international community, and the NGO's obligations to witness. The attempt to turn political questions into technical ones, or to deflect the political, then attempts to neutralize this whole question. And the, in this way, the work of saving also ends up potentially silencing. So the humanitarianism of the question of Palestine seems to me to be entangled in this double dynamic, a depoliticization of Palestinian claims, even as existing as a Palestinian, or saying Palestine, particularly in this country, is already a political claim. The chapters elegantly draw out oppositions that are subtle, momentary, sometimes durable, and that are internal to this field of humanitarianism uh, surrounding Palestinian refugees from the grammars of humanitarianism versus development, saving versus improving lives, the host state's obligations to their own citizens or to the refugees or to humanity, the three-way battle between relief uh, agencies, states, exter and external funding from the UN, and then the refugees themselves, from being reduced to bare life to the imperative to make bare life bearable, from contestation over sumud uh, or uh, withstanding and resilience as a national virtue to the exclusions that it puts into play and its displacement, it seems, perhaps, by the discourse of uh, istihmal or enduring and putting up with. Uh, to the opposition between life and dignity, the disagreements that we heard about between generations of refugees, and uh, this was, I think, one of the moments that really affected me. The, uh, idea of suffering as either something to be uh, ameliorated or uh, as something that produces uh, duties or as something that uh, one uh, has not experienced enough. Uh, there were these moments where uh, some refugees uh, said, uh, you know, compared to the refugees in these other camps, uh, I'm actually very ashamed of myself. Uh, I live this comfortable life in this camp compared to uh, uh, people in uh, the uh, other one. Uh, to also communal, uh, from the communal to the new form of individuation and foreignness as different populations get moved around. All this is tracked with uh, really remarkable uh, uh, clarity and uh, precision uh, from the right to political life to the right to uh, bear life and from the camp as a space of saving to the camp. And here I think is the real clu a crucial argument to the camp as a space that is generative of politics. In these binaries, in these dilemmas, and in the ways that they're beautifully subverted, uh, Ilana de-exceptionalizes the camp as a site of politics, and she brings out in really full force the knots of concepts, the wages of survival, and the contradictions of belonging. Refugees are displaced, and the category and the experience are structured by distinct temporality. So I want to go to uh, the same point that Jordana uh, uh, mentioned about uh, time. Uh, and this is not, I think, simply the uh, limbo of waiting or the linearity of coming to a solution. The temporality seems to actually structure the book as a whole in terms of second, third, and even later generation Palestinians uh, being refugees with the humanitarian or political rights to the ways that 1948 and other key dates restructure and punctuate time, how they're remembered, how they're forgotten by different generations to the temporality of life itself, from being born in a refugee camp to the valuation of who lives and who dies with undercare. The temporality is punctuated by wars, by the withholding of funds, or by the shrinking of space. And most importantly, and I think also this is another thing that was, uh, 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 this book really affected me, uh, 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 also quite, uh, felt kind of personal for me, was uh, this question of, uh, the possibility of imagining a different time, a different rhythm, and a different future. So the part that uh, stuck with me uh, in the book most uh, vividly, and actually when I knocked on some neighbor's doors, uh, like in uh, the hallway, uh, and was like, can I tell you about this? Uh, this is in uh, chapter seven, uh, which is uh, remarkable, and uh, I think I'm not exaggerating when I say it's one of the most important texts I have read on Palestine. In the campus and camps, through different projects, the capacity to anticipate 
and to imagine a different future is at work. The refugees at this point were invited to imagine life years after their return, I think uh, in the year 2034, 2040, something like that. And their answers, their identifications with the camps, but also their imaginings of mobility, their imaginings of different nodes and networks and layers of material and affective bonds, intimate and political. These really go beyond the limitations of the state, of discourses about society, and different discourses about states of exception. These are actually not just alternate futures, but alternate ways of orienting ourselves towards time and space. So through the refugees, uh, Ilana restores not just life lived in relief, but the possibilities of thinking beyond and even after the humanitarian frame in which the refugee and the camp uh, 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 are the uh, first sites in which we might think about uh, generating uh, politics in our time. Uh, I'll stop there. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to answer some questions that came up, but before that, I just want to thank all of you for this incredible time. about timeliness of projects, which I think is something that we all um, are grappling with in our work and sort of problems of writing to the contemporary. Um, but as a methodological question, I was asking about the relationship between your field work and your documentary research, your archival work, and you know what you thought was possible in each mode or what kinds of different arguments they generated. And then um, the more contemporary question, I guess, is what sort of political futures you think might emerge um, from that new orientation of perspective that comes out of the final chapters? Um, so maybe I'll start with the second, actually, because I think that, precisely because I think this is something that, you know, rather than getting into the weeds, so we can do that, um, that runs across all of our texts, which is, which is that there is the, there's two things. There's the sort of weight of the, of the, present um, that in which, you know, so this is both a historical problem and a current problem. That is, every every moment that, that I'm tracing, and I think that, that you are each tracing, has its own weight of the present. Um, and then we come with the weight, we, whoever is writing, come with the weight of our presence. And so part of, actually, I think one of the, the challenges and maybe this isn't so non-responsive to your, your methodological question, is how to try to both somewhat analytically disentangle, but also give space for those different weights of the present. Because when you know, for, I'm thinking about the ways in which refugees are trying to grapple with the capacity to make political claims in a situation that seems to deny them politics, they, they are doing that with an eye to a future, but in a present that is pressing very, very sharply on them, right? The impact, you know, there's the constant struggle with the impasse of the present. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that, that, I, was, that I was trying to do, and I, I really sort of see, see this in all work, is try to figure, to try to capture what are the impasses of, you know, a given theoretical apparatus, right? The impact, you know, the impasses of a of a particular moment, and I do think that um, for me, the cross cutting across through archives and ethnography is a is a helpful way to try to do some of that work. They never feel as methodologically as different as people might, you know. As people often think, you know, think they will. Like the, you know, in a, one, 
in the, in the archival record, including in the archival record that is a record of institutions, there are, there is the presence of refugees. Um, and, and not only and not only boxed into the bureaucratic categories of humanitarian regulation. So you can see that you can get at some of the kind of voicing that you might get at in in field work. Um, and field work has its also the limitations of the you know the structures that you might find in, in the archive. But the going going across them anyway, this was very dumb. I always I, I found very Question? Question, if I may. Sure. Thank you so much for coming to present your books to us. This was incredibly interesting. Um, I have a question about children. Um, for Jordana, but also because in, of the time issues in your book, this may pertain to your work as well. Um, when thinking about the permea permeability of the different categories to which refugees and non-refugees who lived in camps might belong. Did you find that the children that you mentioned, the Basque children who were fleeing the Spanish Civil War and the other group of children, did you find that they were more quickly or easily assigned to, to different kinds of categories than their adult counterparts? Or did you find instead that the multiplicity of categories crossed gen uh, generations and crossed age um, as you were looking at those groups? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the questions that maybe resonates the most with the contemporary um, refugee crisis is the question of who counts as a child, and that is very much um, at stake in the debates on refugees in the 1930s, both with the Basque children and with the Jewish children. And so one thing that's really notable is the state's um, vacillation on the age limits that are set around who is defined as a child. And so as the Spanish, the Spanish Civil War um, fluctuates and its fortunes fluctuate, um, the British state, you know, kind of grasps at different meanings for children who will be rescued from Spain. Um, and it, at one point they're talking really only about children from ages 5 to 12, then at some point they go up to 16. Um, they talk sometimes about going even younger. Um, and so I think that like in debates today we see about um, Syrian children entering Britain are unaccompanied minors, and they have a different resonance now because there's a sort of um, uh, overlay of technology, you know, like should we x-ray people's teeth, should we x-ray their wrists, and, and a kind of anxiety about truth claims about our people pretending to be children to be counted as refugees. You can see how those questions of age and generation are tied to the very category of refugee itself. Um, and the older children, you know, are, there's always tremendous anxiety about teenagers, right? Because they don't have the um, the luxury that the sort of true children have as being counted as apolitical, um, and so that is the the kind of um, beauty that comes with being defined as a Basque child refugee or a Jewish child refugee is that there's much less anxiety about the politics of those refugees. But as older children and teenagers are accepted. Um, the the anxieties about them shift to being, you know, are they anarchists, are they communists, are they going to destabilize British teenagers, are they going to be co-opted by British communists, um, all kinds of, of different anxieties. And so one thing I found really interesting in comparing those groups is that there is so much more anxiety about the Basque children than the Jewish children, and there's much more acceptance of the idea that the kinder are always children no matter how old they are, but the Basques very quickly age out of being children and um, age into being frightening political caricatures. So I think there are differences between ethnic groups in, in who gets to be a child and who doesn't. More questions? May I follow up on sure. one question? Yeah, I, I haven't had the chance to read your book, of course, but what you say now uh, prompts a, a question. Uh, it's, it's who are so because 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 many of the Basque uh, refugees uh, that left uh, the peninsula during the during the civil war also were uh, accepted in French camps mm -hmm. and in particular in French camps that were 
all over, you know, uh, uh, nearby the, the, the borderline in the Basque, in French Basque country, or in uh, Bram, or in Archeliers, etc. So, and, and there they, they, they were under specific circumstances that were ex politically very, very uh, harsh on them, also because Pétain at the time had con considered them undesirable, but they didn't put all together. So, um, so are, is, is, is there a different population of Basque refugees that crosses from France to Britain or that goes directly to Britain or that are somehow saved from the French, uh, from the French camps or something like that? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, all of the Basque children in the camp that I looked at, which is North Stoneham, all came directly from Spain, so they're not going through France. But there are British um, women aid workers who visit the camps in France, and that's part of the case they make to British aid organizations about why they need to bring more children directly to Britain, because the conditions in the French camps are so harsh. So they would say, you know, those children are not being um, aided, they're being interned, right? So there's, there's a British pride in differentiating the British camps from French ones uh, for Basque children specifically. Can I ask you a question of Murat? Um, the, I, I wanted to ask you about something that I, I didn't have a chance to really get into in the comments. So that I mentioned that he's, you've got these three alternatives, truce, um, which I found especially compelling. Um, and particular piece, and then and separation, and it's separation I want to ask you about because when you brought it up in the in, in the introduction, my first thought was, oh, what separation is this? Like this tolerance discourse, and then of course you get to it, and you're like, this is not this is not tolerance. You know, but what uh, but what Wendy Brown talked about? This is something else. This is the capacity for some other kind of seeing in being a part. Um, some other possibility. But again, in my parochial reading it through Palestine, the language of yes. separation has been not so walls. generative, right? Yes. Um, so, um, and not just walls, but the but the language of the language of Oslo. The, the way that we're going to resolve this is to separate, right? Whereas there is potentially the, the way we're going to do something is truce. Like truce seems helpful. So I guess I, I want you to convince me more about separation, or say more about yeah, it. Yeah. No. Know, sure. Uh, so. I think on the question of Palestine, yes, I would not go in the, so the way that I see the three sort of other possibilities uh, isn't as, uh, uh, here's a, uh, here's either the way forward for any particular given set of political problems, or uh, uh, here's uh, how now we should be reconceptualizing peace, but rather here are three things which uh, we tend to, uh, uh, What's the uh, that which we tend to denigrate or we don't elevate to the level of uh, 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 political theory and philosophy uh -huh. that actually deserve uh, a uh, that basically deserve a seat at the table at the very least. Uh, so when it comes to separation, there I'm really just thinking of how the part of what the language of peace has tended to smuggle in sometimes through the language of forgetfulness, but I think that's a different mm -hmm. uh, uh, strand that uh, we can talk about either now or uh, later. Uh, the, uh, it tends to smuggle in this idea of uh, uh, you either have two peoples living side by side uh, in uh, uh, harmony or living together in one state in harmony, when actually part of the politics of uh, uh, part of the politics period is in fact the disharmony. It's in fact the disunity. It's in fact the uh, the fact that the kinds of conflicts and disagreements the uh, the language of peace attempts to usually smooth over can't be smoothed over. So for separation, there I'm thinking of more uh, more of how uh, that's something that we do on a daily basis, which is separate from people or groups that we find objectionable. Is something that actually presents us with yet another way of modalizing peace that's not about togetherness, not about agreement, not about harmony, not about friendship, not about all these sorts of positive things. So uh, I completely agree with you that uh, uh, the other thing we can say is the language of separation is itself central to uh, a lot of the uh, history of race in the US, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that would be yet another troubling instantiation of it. But I think. I would then want to say that each of these three is not pure, right? And that's part of what the book is really about, the, uh, 
the, uh, the search for purity, for purity uh, is part of what peace has uh, provided moral cover for. Uh, I, mean, I was wondering about numbers, right? How, uh, numbers in the camps in um, Britain at different times, right? Um, and also, and also so um, they vary quite a bit across these groups. So the Belgian refugees are uh, numerically, I think, the largest group. Um, uh, so more than 100,000. Um, whereas, uh, so the Diamond Asians, 22,000 um, come through camps. And then I think the smallest group I look at is probably the Anglo-Egyptians. We're talking there more about five or 6,000 people. So there's a lot of variation um, and there's as I said, also tremendous variation in terms of how long people stay in camps, with the Polish case just being the most entrenched case, um, where, in fact, many of the refugee camps for Poles have to be turned into old age homes because it is impossible to um, get the people out of camps. So there's, there's a lot of um, diversity of that kind of experience of what it even means to have been in a camp, um, what that entails. Yeah, but part of the question is, you know, depending on the size of the camp, mm. what the relations are with the, you know, with the people around the global community. economy, the mm -hmm. porousness of the, is there, is there, any, is there any correlation? Um, to the size of the camp? Yeah, or what are the, what are the things that would make, you know, mm. the porous, you know, you said the permeable boundaries or the community. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that the um, the sort of prototypical camp in Britain is the Army or Air Force base. Um, that's sort of the most common space of encampment, although there are exceptions, like the Basque children are basically out in this field and they have bell tents. Um, so it's, it's not the only kind of camp that exists. But I think that what's interesting to me in, in Britain is that those bases have themselves rich local histories. So some bases you know, have been very active since um, the Second World War, the Korean War, et cetera. You know, people go to them as sites of commemoration. They have Veterans Day celebrations at them. So some of those bases have been kind of richly integrated into local British life for a long time. By the same token, some of them have been sites of protest, right? So there are bases that are very detested um, by local populations. So I think that, I mean, there's a, there's a real temptation to, um, chalk up everything about the reaction to different refugee groups to racism, and that's certainly part of what um, structures British responses. But I think it also has to do with the constant reactivation of these spaces that already have a pretty um, a pretty diverse life in local memory. Right. So whether people see these spaces as an annoyance and an intrusion and a site of violence in local life, you know, creating noise pollution, leaving um, spent bullets all over people's fields, things like that. Um, or whether those bases have been really part of a kind of um, wartime commemoration culture, I think also really structures the way people move in and out of those camps and see them as being totally isolated from their community or really having been part of it. So there's a prehistory for all of those bases as well. I mean, in the Palestinian instance, so just first the sort of overall numbers, in 1948 about 750,000 Palestinians um, became refugees, but only about half of refugees ever lived in camps. So this is, you know, the, the, the focus of my research is on the camps. People are moving in and out of them, but that, that never describes the, first of all, the fullness of the Palestinian experience, but even of the refugee experience, and even of the experience of people who get humanitarian services, because you're not required to live in a camp mm -hmm. to have access to services, but this is the most dense site for this. So, but you, 750,000 in 1948, there are about 5 million people registered with UNRWA now. Um, far less than half of them live in camps. So in a place like Jordan, you know, it might be 15% of um, refugees live in camps. Um, in a place like, in Lebanon where conditions are much more difficult, uh, about, it is still about half. Um, and the the, you know, here also there's lots of resonance around this question of varying degrees of, of permeability and, and relation. In some cases, it has to do with, the, with geography, and those geographies have shifted over time. 
So to take just an example, the Shakti Beach Camp in in now in Gaza City, when it was built, it was on the beach, a ways away from Gaza City, and now it is, a, you know, it is dis visually distinguishable, but it is surrounded by the city, right? And it is, and there there is no there is no barrier, but there is a presence, right? And that's a very common feature. So camps in in East Amman similarly are are sort of built into the, into, um, you folded into the landscape. Um, and also, again, the, the kind of permeability of populations, not only in many places, especially, uh, you know, especially in Jordan, West Bank, and Gaza, for obvious reasons, population on either side of those boundaries are Palestinians, population on either side of those boundaries may be refugees, but also inside camps, and this is especially true in Jordan, in Lebanon, <coughs> again, things are very different now in Syria, the populations in camps are not only Palestinians. Um, so Sh Shatila um, is by now not majority Palestinian through all of the layers of, of history. So, um, yeah. Yeah. There's time for one question. Maybe the one who asked. Oh, good. There's a question. Yeah. Should I have to follow up to that one? At what point does a camp stop being a camp. Mm -hmm. I think it's something like Balaka or Chitila is another good example, where it becomes so subsumed in the surrounding community that almost those lines don't exist. It's poorer in many ways than the neighborhood next door, but it's not distinguishedly dis different. And so is it the politics of the place where it is and what, how services are delivered? Is it how it's defined externally? Is it related to that definition of refugee in that that is something that, I mean, is it is it a camp because it's where you live as a refugee with the desire to return? Right. Um, thank you for that question because it gives me an opportunity to tell one of my favorite stories about trying to do this research, which was the, the grant reviewer who tried to deny me my grant, which I got. <laughs> um, but uh, there was the one reviewer of an NSF um, or, you know, responded to my proposal by saying, well, you know, the study of, of humanitarianism, that's a fine subject, um, but, but why would you study the pathology? Um, and Palestinians are not refugees because they're not going home, and where they live are not camps because they look like slums anywhere else. Um, and so in some sense, I mean, while I saw that as really political, um, I, it does also reflect, you know, a view of camps, and it actually provides an entry point for thinking precisely, you know, in a better way, your question, which is what, what is a camp? What makes a camp? Um, and in some sense, it's all of the things that you said. So the, a, there are you know, actual, ter you know, territorial boundaries to the camp. There are regulatory boundaries. You know, what, it, how, what does that look like on the ground? You know, so in this camp in East Saman that I was talking about where there, there is absolutely no visual distinction because the camp, in fact, has spilled over the boundaries. How do you know when you're in the camp and not in the camp? It's who collects the garbage. Because if you're not in the camp, the municipality collects the garbage. If you're in the camp, I'm not collects the garbage. But <laughs> that's only one layer, right? So that I mean that is a distinguishing feature. But the camp is a, is um, a space. I mean, and you, this was a precisely sort of as you said it is in a space where refugees live. That was an argument that the Syrian government made to UNRWA to, when they were trying to get UNRWA to recognize Yarmouk as an official camp. So Yarmouk, which was the biggest Palestinian refugee camp functionally um, until the Syrian conflict, was not an official camp. It was an unofficial camp. And the Syrian government in the 50s was saying, a camp is, you know, is where the refugees are. Um, but it is, a, it, is a, it is where the refugees are, and it is a, sort of a dense space of refugee community and refugee, you know, um, refugee networks. Right? And so I think, I mean, there, you know, Palestinian camps do, you know, fundamentally do not look like camps as people imagine them, and they are not camps as they were two decades ago, three decades ago, four decades ago, but they are camps in new and live ways, both for the, you know, for the, for the regulatory, political, and kind of effective and emotional um, reasons that I've listed, and because they are the center, you know, they are, they are, they are a, they are the space in which Palestinians are targeted. If I could just add to that in the British context, I would say that um, 
one thing that happens to refugee camps after they are emptied of the particular group of refugees who inhabited them is that now they've been turned into detention centers, or at least some of them have. So refugees have really been replaced by detainees. I mean, you can't, in a way, the reason there's no more camps in Britain, which is a question I've gotten sometimes, you know, why are there still refugee <laughs> camps? Is it because there aren't refugees? There are only illegal immigrants and asylum seekers and bogus asylum seekers, right? So those categories have been renamed and have been relinked to um, detention regimes in negative ways. I hate to end on that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>